Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to come this morning and to worship together as the corporate body, giving praise to you, our God and King. This morning, as we focus on the incarnation of Christ, God, the eternal Son of God, becoming man, in the womb of a virgin, God, we give you praise for our Redeemer and the great salvation that is found in Christ alone. And God, I pray for those here this morning, those who are not saved, those who have never been born again, those who have never trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray for those who give themselves to everything but not to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment this morning that you might grant them grace and faith to believe. And I pray that they would turn unto Christ and be saved, confessing with their mouth that he is Lord and believing in their hearts that he is indeed risen from the grave. We pray for salvation in the house of the Lord. I pray that you would attend to the preaching of your word with power and that we would receive it as the word of God and not as a word of man. Father, I do pray for your assistance, for the anointing of the Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. So let's go ahead and look there, and I'm going to be taking these glasses on and off, on and off, so uh, just work with me, all right? In Galatians chapter 4, I want you to look there at verse 4, and the scripture says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent. I want you to think about that for a moment. When the fullness of time had come, God sent. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that he might, or so that we might receive adoption as sons. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm sure that most of us are aware, perhaps all of us are aware, of the great hymn of our faith entitled, Because He Lives. As a matter of fact, I'm sure that some of you, even now, could probably quote every word of that Christian hymn, Because He Lives. Let me say a little bit more about that hymn. In 1971, this hymn was written during a time of great social upheaval. There was threats of war here in America and around the world. There was betrayals of national and personal trust. And it was into this type of world that such a time uh, that this hymn was written. There was assassinations going on, drug traffic. War was being monopolized upon the headlines, and it was the Gaithers themselves who wrote that song in 1971. Here are the first part of that stanza. Here is the first part of that stanza. It says, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. The reason I want to share that hymn with you and some of its historical background is because of the first part of that hymn, which says, God sent His Son. God sent His Son when? During the time of Roman peace, during a time of the Pax Romana that we learned last week, but specifically according to this passage, God sent his son in the fullness of time. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon all over again, but just to remind you, in the fullness of time, at the exact moment, 
the very second, preordained by God, before the foundation of the world, God sent His Son into the world. The sending of God's Son was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It was the fulfillment of God's promises that He made to Adam and Eve and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and King David. In the fullness of time, as you'll recall from last week, at the exact time preordained by God within the divine council between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the world was ever spoken into existence in eternity past, the exact second was determined. In the fullness of time, prophecy was fulfilled, promises were kept. In the fullness of time, you'll remember the Savior came. And in the fullness of time, God made himself accessible to whosoever will believe and trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So when we look at that phrase, in the fullness of time, it tells us a lot about God's sovereignty and about God's providence and about God's faithfulness. In the fullness of time, at the exact right moment. I love the him because he lives and we know that oftentimes we sing that not at Christmas but when? Easter. Easter. But I would suggest to you that just as appropriate as this song is to Easter, it is just as appropriate to Christmas. I'll remind you again that this hymn was written during a time of great social upheaval. We look at what's going on in our world today, and I think that it's very possible that that hymn could have been written in our day. Talks of war and social upheaval, headlines that are depressing, that seem to monopolize our headlines. You can't watch the news without getting depressed, (laughs) I'm telling you. But we are reminded That is such a time that God sent His Son, as the hymn says. Is that not what this passage says? That in the fullness of time, God sent His Son. And we are reminded in this hymn that God not only sent His Son into the world to be born of a virgin, but God sent His Son into the world to die. The purpose of Christmas is so that Christ would come and die. That's why the front of your bulletin has the picture of a pregnant womb and the cross. Christ came to die. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. This morning, we do not discuss the empty grave, but what we do discuss is the filled womb. God sent forth His Son in the fullness of time, and they called him Jesus, and he came to love, to heal and forgive. He came, and he bled and died to buy my pardon, and the womb is full, and there it proves my Savior lives. Last week, we looked at what God did. What did God do? God, in the fullness of time, sent His Son. This week, we're going to look at how God did it. Last week, God sent His Son in the fullness of time. That's what God did. And now we're going to look at how God did it. How did God do it? Through the womb of a virgin. Now, let me just say a couple things as we prepare to walk through this this sermon. 
Now, let me just say a couple of things uh, ahead of time. Uh, first of all, I want us to break this verse down. We already know what the fullness of time means, especially if you were here last week. We broke that phrase down, and we looked at it in, 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 in detail. And so if you would like to go back and hear that sermon, all you have to do is go back to the website. And I did a whole sermon on that phrase, in the fullness of time, and what that means. Well, we're going to move a little bit further now in this passage. And it says, in the fullness of time, what did God do? God sent his son. You know, you may not be aware, but that tells us a lot about who Christ is. It speaks of his divine sonship. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. Do you know that that phrase is an absolute exclamation of the deity of Christ? That Christ is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Christ is divine. He is fully God, and that is the reason that he is called the Son of God. He is of the same essence of the Father. He is of the same nature as the Father and of the Holy Spirit. He has the same attributes, which is the nature of God, as the Father and the Holy Spirit. We worship a triune God. One God and three persons. And oftentimes we focus on the threeness of God. To the extent that we forsake the oneness of God. Yes, God is three persons, but God is also one. Have you ever gone to one of the Psalms and read a Psalm and then contemplate in your mind... Is this referring to the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Have you ever done that? You know what that is a sign of? It means that you are focusing more on the threeness of God at the great harm of the oneness of God. For example, I read to you this morning from Psalms 95 which talked about the Lord being the maker of the heaven and, and the earth. And oftentimes when we read that and we say, well, is this talking about God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? And thus we focus on threeness. But what I would have us to do this morning is to acknowledge the threeness, but let us focus on the oneness of God. And when the Bible says He is maker of heaven and earth, it is not just talking about the Father. It's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. And what can be said about the Father can be said about the Son. Do they have distinct roles? Most assuredly they do. But we can refer to the Father as the creator of the world and we can refer to the Son as the creator of the world and be thoroughly faithful to Scripture in saying it. So we look at this passage in Galatians and the fullness of time God sent his son. As a matter of fact, that's my first point this morning. God sent his son. And this tells us so much about the deity of Christ. Do you remember what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6? He said, for unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. Even Isaiah the prophet says that a child was born who is the son of God. God sent his son. That tells us a lot about who took initiative. We as humans took the initiative in sinning against God. But God himself took the initiative in saving the sinner. God, in the fullness of time, what did he do? He took the initiative to save the world by sending his son. And who is his son? God. Divine? Is this not the true expression of the Christian gospel? To deny the deity of Christ is to, not, is to deny the gospel. You cannot be saved and deny the, fleet, the complete and full deity of Jesus Christ. 
You cannot be saved and believe that Jesus is a little God. You cannot be saved and believe that Jesus was created. You cannot be saved and believe that Jesus is a God among many gods. Or a lesser God. You cannot be saved and believe that Jesus became God at his baptism. The truth of biblical Christianity is is that Jesus Christ is the eternal God who spoke the world into existence and took on flesh. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is God. We look at these passages and we think, well, God sent his Son. Yes, he did, but what does that passage tell us about the nature of Jesus? He's divine. Not partly divine, but fully divine. Can I just tell you something that I've personally written in my notes that is intended for no one else to see but me? Let me read it to you. It says, Do your best, Blake, by the Spirit, to magnify the preexistent glory of Christ. May God help me. That's what it says right there in my notes. God, help me to magnify the preexistent glory of Jesus Christ, who is the eternal God who took on flesh. The doctrine of the deity of Christ is the utmost importance of Christian theology. If Christ is not God who came in the flesh, there is no salvation. We're lost because only God himself could live a perfect life. Only God himself could satisfy his own wrath. And that's exactly what Jesus did. If Jesus is not God, then there is no salvation, there's no atonement, there's no forgiveness of sin, and we all are lost. But the Bible does teach us that Jesus Christ is the only unique, the monogamous, the only begotten, unique Son of God. As a matter of fact, I, this is one of those sermons that I wish I had three hours to preach. One of the things I try to teach our young preachers is to pace your sermons. You need to have proper pacing. I will, what that means is you want to give the same amount of time to each point. So you're not rushing through one and belaboring another. Well, I will utterly fail at that this morning. This is a bad example. But I want to magnify the preexistent glory of Jesus. So let me point to you, let me point to you a few passages of scripture that uphold the preexistent glory of Christ that point to the fact that Christ is God. One of the most profound scriptures to me is found in John chapter 1. These will be on the screen. But I would prefer to, for you to turn in your Bible. But in John chapter 1, we read these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. There's so much there about the preexistence of Christ, His deity. In the beginning was the Word. That tells us that the Word, whoever this Word is, the Word is eternal. He's eternal. He's never been created. There was, there was not a time when he did not exist. This points to the eternality of the Word. The Word of God is eternal. And the Word was with God. That points to personhood. There's one God, but whoever this Word is, not only is he eternal, but he's with God. That points to the Trinity. And the Word was God. This means that the Word, whomever it is, is divine. The Word was God. The Word was in the beginning with God. 
and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. He's the creator. And without him was not anything made that was made. And then he tells us who the word is in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who became flesh and dwelt among us? Christ did. That is the essence. I mean, that is the essence of the incarnation. That God became flesh and dwelt among us. That Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, what does this passage tell us about Christ? It tells us that he is eternal. That he is the eternal God who spoke the world into existence. Along with the Father, along with the Spirit, one God, three persons, and Specifically, we are focusing on Christ, so Christ is God, He is eternal, He's omnipotent, why? Because He created all things and nothing has come into being apart from Him. He is sovereign, Lord, governing, and providential over all things, omniscient, omnipresent. All these things are true about the person of Christ and what does the Christmas story tell us? And this eternal God who is truly divine, who spoke the world into existence, who created man from the dust of the earth and woven from the rib of man, became flesh, incarnate. That mean, that's where we get the word incarnation from. It means in flesh. God came in flesh. And as I told you before, the truth of the incarnation is the foundational principle of our salvation. Let me, let me show you another passage that truly affirms the preexistent glory of Christ. Look at Colossians, if you will. Colossians chapter 1. And this is what the Word of God says about Christ. He is the image, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. That means he is sovereign Lord with all authority. Verse 16, by him all things were created. By who? By Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. The God that we can't see is manifested to us in Christ. He is God. He is the creator of all things. All things where? In heaven and on earth. Things visible and invisible, whether it's thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, that's, those are the things in the spiritual world. He created them all. He creates things that you see and things that you can't see. He creates things in the physical world. He creates all things in the spiritual world. All things are created through him. And why are they created? For him. They're created for his glory. Christ is the preexistent eternal God who creates heaven and earth, visible, invisible, things you see, things you can't see, things in the earth, things in the heavenly. All things were created through him, for him, for his glory. He is before all things. He is the preeminent one. And in him all things hold together. He's the sovereign one. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. Why? Because he is God. He's the Word, the eternal, pre existent God who was with the Father from eternity past, who spoke the world into existence, the image of the invisible God, the creator of heaven and earth, invisible and invisible. All things came into being through him, and all things exist for his glory. And in him all things are held together. Oh, what a glorious picture of the pre-existent, pre-incarnate Christ. And then we look at Hebrews. Hebrews. Hebrews 1. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it, folks. I, I'm just, two things I'm not going to be able to do is to truly magnify the preexistent glory of Jesus. And the second thing I'm not going to be able to do is get through this sermon. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. I just want to unleash and preach. So, Hebrews 1, verse 1, look at this. Talking about Christ, oh God, 
Help me, Lord. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. God created the world through him. Look at verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the power of his word. And making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Oh, beloved, what have we read just so far? What have we learned about the the pre-existing glory of a pre-incarnate Christ? What have we learned about the Son of God before he was ever born of a virgin? What have we learned about Jesus before Christmas? That he is the very one who spoke the world into existence. He is the very one who upholds all things, created all things. He is the very one who sustains all things. He is the very one who governs all things. And we learn from Hebrews that, listen, he is the very radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of the glory of God. And in him, the fullness of God did dwell. This is all before Christmas. What is this telling us about Christ? It is telling us many things. I'm going to make an adjustment in my notes just for a moment. It tells us that he is eternal. That Christ himself is eternal. Do you know what Psalms 90 verse 2 says? If we think about it Christologically. If we think about oneness. You know what Christologic, Christo, reading Christological emphasis in Psalms 90? As it says this. Before, before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting you are God. Christ is eternal. Before there was ever earth, before the mountains were ever created, before he even spoke the world into existence, what does the psalmist tell us in Psalms 90 verse 2? From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. We also learn from the psalms that Christ is immutable. He's unchanging. Psalms 102 verses 25 and 27. Of old... You had laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe. They will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. The things that you have created, O Christ, the things that you have created, O oh, pre-existent, eternal Son of God, the things that you have created, they will roll up. But you will remain the same. You are unchanging. You are the sovereign, the sovereign Lord of Lords and King of Kings who spoke the world into existence, who governs all things sovereignly. You are the very majesty and glory of God, and that will never change change. You are the same. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. This is true of Christ before Christmas. The song, Jeremiah the prophet fully affirms the omnipresence of God, omnipresence of Christ. In Jeremiah 23, verses 23 through 24, we read these words. I am, am I Am I God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places that I cannot see, declares the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth? Oh, the pre-incarnate, pre-existent glory of the Lord, that he, what, feels heaven and earth. Literally, heaven and earth cannot contain him. He cannot be contained by what he has made. He is transcendent. 
He is far, far above. He is other than us. He is outside of space and time. He works in time. But past, present, and future are all encompassed in present to God because he sees all things simultaneously. The very one who governs all things and sustains all things and sovereign ruler, king of kings and lord of lords is the very one who humbled himself to become flesh in a womb. The psalmist tells us that the pre-incarnate Christ is omniscient. Psalms 147 verse 5, great is our Lord, abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Oh yes, our pre-incarnate Christ reveals his pre-existing glory in the fact that he is eternal, immutable, omnipresent, omniscient. He is omnipotent. Psalms 3, 7 says that he breaks the teeth of the wicked. And then Psalms 93 tells us that he reigns robed in majesty. Christ, the very word of God who spoke the world into existence, the very one who's the radiance of the glory of God, the very one who created heaven and earth and sustains heaven and earth and is outside of heaven and earth and the heavens cannot contain him. He is the very eternal, immutable, omnipresent, omniscient, omnit omnipotent, majestic God. This is Christ. Do you not believe, beloved, that it was Christ, that it was the that it was it was a type of Christ that Moses saw on the backside of the wilderness? Moses saw a bush that was burning, a burning bush. That was not consumed. The burning bush that Moses saw was none other than a manifestation of the very majesty and glory of God. It is the very majesty and glory of Christ who himself is a consuming fire. He is the rock that was split in order to give thirst. Quits the thirst of the world. He is the manna that came from heaven in order to satisfy man. He is the cloud by day and the fire by night. The very glory and manifest presence of God. He is the lightning that bursts forth on Sinai. He is the, he is the very glory of God. And so much more could be said. So much more could be said about the pre-existent, pre-incarnate glory of Christ. The Old Testament typifies Christ in so many ways. The tabernacle, the temple, Old Testament sacrifices. Aaron typified Christ as the high priest who mediated between God and man. And Moses typified Christ as the great deliverer of God's people. Abraham typified Christ, the father of a great nation. David typified Christ as king. We have theophanies and types and shadows All throughout the Old Testament. And it's Christ telling us that he is God. He is the redeemer of mankind. And it was the father who sent forth his son. And it was the spirit who sustained Christ. All three persons of the triune Godhead were actively involved in the incarnation, the crucifixion. The resurrection, 
the ascension, the mediation, and the coming. It's a triune work. But God did not become, the Father did not become flesh. The Spirit did not take on flesh. But it was God the Son who took on flesh willingly. I conclude with a final verse on my first point. Come back Christmas morning for the rest of it. Where you will hear about God sending forth His Son, born of a woman. How God humbled Himself to become a zygote. How God humbled Himself And the fact that he took on flesh in a fallopian tube. Did you hear what I just said? God took on flesh in a fallopian tube. Which traveled to the uterus and attached itself to the wall in the womb. What? What? You just said, wait a minute, preacher. You just said that Jesus Christ is God who spoke the world into existence, who created heaven and earth, and they cannot contain him. You just said that Jesus is the radiance of the very glory of God. He is the sovereign one who sustains all things, upholds all things, created all things, governs all things. You just told me that Christ is the eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutable, majestic God. And now you're telling me that he was a zygote? A fertilized egg? Wow! Holy cow! You know what I'm saying? I, I, what? Yeah. It's the miracle of the incarnation and the expression of the very humility of God. In the sacredness that God himself places on the womb of women. So let me close with one more big picture. One more big picture of the glory of the pre-incarnate, pre-existing, eternal God the Son of God. Do you know that really John helps us here? John the Apostle tells us in the Gospel of John that the vision that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 was actually Christ. You see this in John chapter 12, verse 41. So John tells us that the vision in Isaiah 6 was a vision of Christ, pre-incarnate Christ, before Christmas, before he ever took on flesh, where he was at and what he was doing, before he became a fertilized egg in a fallopian tube. Would you like to turn to Isaiah 6 for a moment? Let's turn there just for a moment and let me show you where Jesus was and what he was doing before he humbled himself to take on flesh. And where did he where did he become man? Where did he become man? Oh, not in Bethlehem. Where did he become man? Oh, not in, not in the manger. Not, in, not even in the womb. 
He became man in the fallopian tube. But where was he and what, he, what was he doing before then? I'm going to try not to just go absolutely Pentecostal on you up here, but this is Isaiah 6, and then we'll be done. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw Yahweh. And by the way, do you know what the New Testament equivalent of Yahweh is? Kyrios. And that is referred to Christ. I saw the Lord. Literally, let's, let's just read it like John said it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Son of God. I saw the pre-existent Christ sitting on a throne. High and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. And with two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called out to the other. Holy, holy, holy is the pre-incarnate Christ. Whose glory fills the whole earth. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, and for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Listen to me, beloved. What does this passage tell us about the pre-existing, pre-incarnate Son of God, what does it tell us? That before the womb, before the incarnation, he was sitting upon his throne in heaven. He was high, sovereign, preeminent. He was Lord of lords and King of kings, sovereign Lord, high. He is in the place of a preeminence and authority. He is high and he is lifted up above all others. He is transcendent. God high above us, other than us. And the majesty of him was so magnificent that heaven itself could not contain him because the train of his robe filled the temple. And don't you know that it spread out from there? And the train of his robe filled the temple. And his presence was so majestic and so glorious that when the sinless angels themselves looked upon the pre-existent, pre-incarnate glory of Christ, when they beheld his glory, the sinless angels called out to one another, Holy, 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 holy is he. We must cover our face. We must cover our face. Lest we look upon him and die. We must cover our face in a sign of reverence. And we must cover our feet in a sign of humility. And we must be ready to fly to do his bidding wherever he tells us to go. So here's the pre-incarnate Christ. The angels ready to do his bidding. He is ruling and reigning over the earth, sovereign Lord, sustaining, upholding all things by the power of his might. You go here and you go there and you do that and you do that. And the reason I'm having you do all these things, you angel go there, and you go there, and you go that. And as a time, he's sending the angels, but what else is he doing? He's governing the world. And he's moving everything in time and eternity to win to the fullness of time. When he would step up from his throne, 
and lay aside his royal garments. He would leave the throne in the praises of the angels to humble himself, to become a fertilized egg in the fallopian tube of a young virgin girl. Why? To redeem. Those who are under the law. Oh, do we not have a Christmas story to tell? <laughs> so I conclude with this. What, is the, and what do we do when we walk away from a sermon like this? You know what you do? We leave in awe. Just all. I don't have any practical application for you. I, I don't have any. I'm, you go home and do this, or you go home and do that. You go, no, I, I want you to just leave here overwhelmed by the beauty and the glory of Christ. I want you to leave here all in all of who He is and, and what He's done. Contemplate. Contemplate pre incarnate Christ and incarnate Christ. And why he did it. I say to those who are here today who are not saved. How could you not come to Christ and be saved? Why would you not want Christ? Why would you not want him? Why would you not want to worship him? Why would you not want to serve him? Why would you not want to live for him? Why? Why? Would you come to Christ and be saved this morning? Would you come to Christ and give your life to Him? Would you come? Listen, I'll be down front. Jerry will be down here with me, ready to receive you. Come and give your life to Christ today and be saved. Father, we commit this time to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen.